Here, 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 here. Mr. Speaker, I'm thankful and, to be honest, humbled by the opportunity to join this important debate. Yesterday, a group of high school students were visiting from my riding, and we talked a few minutes about this debate and what would unfold in, in their parliament. I told them that we were about to tackle one of those rare questions in the social and political -like life of a country, watershed moments where we can translate our values into a law and touch the lives of Canadians in a profound way. I believe this is one of those moments. Let me say from the outset that I will be supporting this bill at second reading. As New Democrats, we've decided that rather than seek consensus on a question so personal, we will be encouraging our members to take the time to consult with their constituents, to reflect carefully on this bill, and to vote with their conscience. So let me affirm from the outset my deep respect and admiration for members, wherever they sit in this House, who rise to express views that may differ from the views that I have on this bill. I'm reminded of something a former Conservative member of the House said when he appeared before the, the Joint Special Committee. At the end of his eloquent and moving testimony, he stopped and looked around and said, with his usual knack for not pulling any punches, by the way, everything you decide here will affect every Canadian who is alive and every Canadian that there will be in the future, and it will probably set the framework for the Western world, so think about it. <laughs> so let me say to Mr. Fletcher, to those young constituents who visited me yesterday, and to every Canadian who will follow this important debate from living rooms and law offices and hospital beds, that I have every confidence that Parliament will give this bill the careful scrutiny it needs and the respectful debate that it deserves. We are here, Mr. Speaker, because of the Supreme Court's unanimous ruling in the Carter case. The case was long and complex, but the decision was crystal clear. I quote, Section 241B and Section 7 of the Criminal Code are void insofar as they prohibit physician-assisted physician death for a competent adult who, one, clearly consents to the termination of life, and two, has grievous and irremediable medical conditions, including an illness, disability, uh, or disease, that causes enduring suffering that is intolerable to the individual in the circumstances of his or her condition. Close quote. That's what the court concluded. It's noteworthy for its humanity. It doesn't force doctors or, or bureaucrats to parse a patient's suffering or weigh precisely how much pain and fear is tolerable and how much intolerable. Instead, it recognizes the ability, indeed the right, of a competent Canadian to decide for themselves when their suffering becomes intolerable in the circumstances of their condition. In fact, the next line of the judgment goes further, recognizing the right of those competent Canadians to define what treatments may be unacceptable for them. It quote, I, I quote, irremediable, it should be added, does not require the patient to undertake treatments they are, that are not acceptable to the individual, close quote. In just seven lines, the Supreme Court of Canada, the highest court in our land, affirmed that competent adult Canadians could consent to the termination of life could define uniquely and for their life what intolerable suffering meant to them and could define to a large degree what an irremediable condition meant to them, respecting their right to refuse treatments they determined to be unacceptable. Not only did the court unanimously affirm the right of competent Canadians to make their choices, it found two provisions of the Criminal Code unconstitutional insofar as they prevented eligible individuals from doing so. So let's remind ourselves, Mr. Speaker, the meaning of that word unconstitutional. In explaining such a finding in the Constitutional Law of Canada, Professor Peter Hogg quotes a U.S. Justice to say this, an unconstitutional act is not a law. It confers no rights, it imposes no duties, it affords no protection, 
it creates no offence. It is, in legal contemplation, as inoperative as though it had never been passed. Professor Hogg continues, when a court holds that a law is unconstitutional, the invalidity of the law doesn't arise from the fact of its having been declared unconstitutional by a court, but from the operation of the supremacy clause of the Constitution. So, Mr. Speaker, in principle, he said, the law is invalid from the moment it is enacted. The fact that the Supreme Court delayed the effect of its ruling in Carter doesn't detract from the force of that finding of unconstitutionality. The Court didn't request that Parliament pare back the prohibition against assisted dying in these cases to a less intrusive level. It demolished the legal barriers that denied Canadians the choice as completely as if they had never been built. The Court then wrote, it is for Parliament and the provincial legislatures to respond, should they so choose, by enacting legislation consistent with the constitutional parameters set out in these reasons." Close quote. Mr. Speaker, that's what we're here to do. To measure this bill against the constitutional parameters illuminated for us by our Supreme Court. I was proud. Mr. Speaker, to serve on the Joint Special Committee on Physician Assisted Dying. Je travaillais dans ce comité avec l'aide de ma collègue extraordinaire, la députée. My extraordinary colleague, the member for Saint Pierre Saint Bagot. I would like to thank her for the many hours of work and her deep knowledge and profound knowledge of the Quebec legislation. I have to add that our report was made all the better by the wisdom she brought to it. The parties and both chambers, we reviewed the Supreme Court judgment and the provincial court decision that preceded it. We looked at laws in Quebec and around the world. We reviewed two major studies which together heard from 13,000 Canadians and over 100 organizations. We held 11 hearings. We called 61 expert witnesses and took written briefs from individuals and group, groups from all across this country. That committee had a duty, in my view, to make recommendations for all Canadians and to consider all the situations that might arise in the coming years and seek clear answers founded on the law, on medical evidence, and on our shared values. So I'm so thankful to all members of that committee for their work, for their commitment to respect and the collaboration beyond and above party lines, their dedication in helping Parliament pass a law that does respect the constitutional parameters set out by the court, in, indeed a law for all Canadians. Now, based on that broad, broad consultation and that evidence, and a strong majority spanning both chambers and all parties, we agreed on 21 recommendations to ensure that eligible Canadians have the option and to protect individuals in situations of particular vulnerability. These recommendations were not made lightly. Each was made after lengthy discussion with an eye to the future, and each was rooted in careful consideration of the evidence the requirements of the Carter case and of our Charter of Rights and Freedoms, and of course on the rights of suffering Canadians. So Mr. Speaker, I must be honest at, at this point, I was deeply disappointed to find the majority of recommendations of the All-Party Committee either missing from or contradicted by the provisions in this government bill. The All-Party Committee recommended that the law use the exact words of the Supreme Court this bill would cloud those words with new and very vague and ambiguous restrictions. Let me pause on that point. Without delving into the details, let me share two concerns about an area so crucial that in my view, and the view of many experts that have called me, it inappropriately narrows the scope of the entire bill. First, this bill would limit its scope to medical conditions that are, quote, incurable. A word the Supreme Court did not use and a requirement that it did not set. 
while the court was quick to make clear that it would never force a patient to undergo unacceptable treatments to provide their to prove their condition was irremediable, no similar direction is found in this bill. None. It would seem to compel patients to undergo treatments that they would object to in order to be eligible for assistance in dying. That, Mr. Speaker, could prove to be cruel and unusual and in itself contrary to the Charter. Second, the bill limits its scope to patients facing what it terms a reasonably foreseeable natural death. Another requirement found nowhere in the decision. In fact, this concept was never raised once before us in, by any witnesses in the all-party committee, nor as far as I can tell does it have any precedent in any jurisdiction. And it's not hard to see why. After all, it's almost hopelessly ambiguous. Does it mean a death that's imminent or simply one that we can predict with confidence? The government has pr provided a glossary that suggests, quote, foreseeable in the not too distant future or, quote, on a trajectory toward death. But of course those terms could be applied to every single one of us. Mm -hmm. I want to read the conclusions of one of Canada's most revered constitutional lawyers, Joseph Arve, QC. I quote, as the lead counsel in the Carter case, I probably know better than anyone the evidence led, the arguments made, and the full implication of the judgment at all levels. And I have no doubt that the bill, if enacted, would be struck down as unconstitutional insofar as the, quote, foreseeability clause is concerned, and perhaps other clauses as well, close quote. Given that the Department of Justice lawyers did not prevail at the Supreme Court of Canada and the case was decided unanimously against their position, I assume the minister has a comprehensive legal opinion from outside counsel. Will she table that opinion at the Justice Committee? Will she force desperately ill Canadians to have to go to the Supreme Court again? These restrictions that have no root in the Supreme Court decision are so fundamental that they affect the scope of the bill itself. But they're not the only ways in which the bill seems to reject the advice of our committee. The all-party committee recommended that the law not exclude patients who co completed a valid request in advance of losing their capacity. This bill would offer those Canadians nothing but the cruel choice the court spoke of. The choice between a death they consider premature and the rising fear of a life they consider intolerable. The All-Party Committee agreed that Indigenous patients should be given the option of a culturally and spiritually appropriate end-of-life and palliative services. It agreed that mental health services and supports for all Canadians must be improved immediately. It agreed that far too few Canadians can access the quality, palliative and end-of-life care they deserve. And it identified concrete steps for the government to take on every one of these priorities for Canadians. And yet, Mr. Speaker, this bill contains nothing binding on any of these. Not one dollar of new funding, not one commitment or timeline. Now, of course, there are those who ask us to be, to be patient, who say this is just a first step. But incremental change offers cold comfort to those suffering intolerably today. Nor does our Charter allow unconstitutional provisions to be made right by degrees, by steps. And there are those who say that while improving palliative care or obeying patients' advance requests or protecting the conscience rights of health care workers are good ideas, they were not named in Carter and so cannot be included in this bill. But neither did Carter mention nurse practitioners or record keeping or witnesses or multiple doctors, all of which, of course, are addressed in this bill. These are all good and practical steps. Indeed, many are recommendations of the all-party committee. So we must replace a conveniently selective attention to Carter with a consistent commitment to the charter rights and health care priorities of all Canadians.
Because, Mr. Speaker, the reality is this moment's not going to come again. Canadians are counting on us to get it right now. This means abiding by the letter and spirit of the Supreme Court ruling and strengthening this bill against obvious challenges to its charter compliance. And it means taking real action on the priorities that Canadians recognize and are connected, including better mental health services and more accessible palliative and end-of-life care options for everyone. So specifically, Mr. Speaker, I'd urge all members to consider recommend Recommendation 19 of the All-Party Committee, which called for the re-establishing of the Secretariat on Palliative and End-of-Life Care, the development of a fully funded pan-Canadian palliative and end-of-life care strategy in collaboration with the provinces, territories, and civil society. Now, as anyone who has sifted through the mountain of evidence on this issue can attest, it is easy to get lost in the details. But the end, at the end of it all, we're called to a question of principle. It's a principle reflected in the words of Mr. Justice Binney in another ruling, which I paraphrase here. He said that while we may first instinctively recoil from a decision to seek death, it is clear that it can arise from a deeply personal and fundamental belief about how we wish to live. We're asked to consider in what circumstances we can deny adult, competent Canadians suffering intolerably from a grievous medical condition the right to make these fundamental decisions. The choices in Carter of what constitutes intolerable suffering and which treatments are acceptable. This is about choice. Canadians want options when they near the end of life or if they find themselves trapped in intolerable suffering. And in my view, the bill before us denies that to too many Canadians, in too many cases, with too little justification. By leaving unresolved so many of the tensions at play in Carter, this bill invites immediate challenges on similar grounds. And these court battles would necessarily engage the full legal resources of this government against the arguments of the most weak and vulnerable Canadians imaginable. That is not what Canadians want. We do not need more conflict, division, or delay. What we need is constructive compromise. And what we insist upon is compliance with the Supreme Court of Canada's unanimous decision. No government can be expected to preempt every challenge to a new law, but a government can at least be expected to recognize that a Supreme Court of Canada decision is not a recommendation we can do better than trying to drive a square peg into a round hole. We can do better than altering the careful words of our Supreme Court of Canada. We can do better than flatly contradicting the evidence of experts and the advice of parliamentarians from all parties and both chambers. We can do better than ex excluding patients whose valid request is approved but who lose capacity just before it can be acted upon. We can do better that con than condemning those people to intolerable suffering because, of course, their condition didn't match the letter of this bill. And finally, and finally, Mr. Speaker, I believe we can do better than offering only non-binding promises of more discussion on issues as urgent as giving every Canadian the mental health services they need and the options for palliative and end-of-life care they richly deserve. Mm -hmm. I truly believe that what I told those young people in Vic from Victoria yesterday, I truly believe it. This is a moment that will not come again for us as legislators. We have a duty to see this House pass a bill that respects the Carter decision, that respects our Charter of Rights and Principles, and that accords with the priorities of Canadians. Sadly, Mr. Speaker, in my judgment, this is not that bill, but it can be. So let's give it the study it needs and the debate Canadians deserve. Let's make whatever changes are needed to meet those standards. Let's do this work together, let's get it right, and let's work assiduously for all Canadians to get it right. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Great.